The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. A standoff 30 years ago. Since a stalemate? I'm Nam Kiwanuka, and tonight on the agenda in the summer, the outstanding land claim issues that still linger for Mohawk and other communities near Oka, Quebec. In the summer of 1990, Canadian soldiers and members of the Mohawk Nation near Oka, Quebec, engaged in a 78-day standoff over land rights. It was a historic encounter with ripples well beyond that time. But it did not ultimately resolve the land claim issues. Joining us now for more from Perth, Ontario, Gahande Hornmiller, an associate professor at Carleton University School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies. And from Kuchiching First Nation in Northwestern Ontario, Sarah Mainville, a former chief and partner at OKT Law. Welcome to you both. Um, Gahande, before we dive in, we should note the term Mohawk is widely known and used, but what do you call yourself? Uh, we call ourselves the Ganyakahaga, which is uh, our own traditional language to describe our origins in the Mohawk Valley, the land of the Flint. Why is it important to acknowledge that, that there's a difference? Um, well, over since in the last 30 years, we've seen a resurgence and a reinvigoration of our traditional language. So back in 1990, we used the term Mohawk ourselves to describe ourselves. But with the desire to bring back our traditional language, we've taken up the term once again and reclaimed it. So we now describe ourselves more widely as Ganyakahaga. Just from what you said, um, it's, you know, to take on someone else's uh, description or someone else's language before we started taping, I said, you know, um, throughout my schooling, I've never been offered or classes, we've never had any classes that teach us indigenous languages. But when you take um, somebody else's description of yourself, um, that must change how you view yourself. Oh, of course. It, it speaks to how we were viewed at first contact and the years following, the centuries following, where a certain uh, impression or a certain worldview was placed on us. Um, we've seen the impacts of that through the residential school system. We've seen it, um, you know, with uh, uh, opposition to our fighting for our lands and our rights in the courts, outside of the courts, on the land. Um, it's it's an imposition of another world view that does has nothing to do with our own view, which is about our connection to the natural world. So the, the words we use to describe ourselves are about that. Uh, we don't have nouns in our language. We have verb. It's a verb-based language, which talks about our relationships to each other, to the natural world. So if anyone trying to understand our language or trying to learn our language, it would bring them a whole new perspective on the natural world and their connection to it. Now, as we look over, um, it's been 30 years since the Oka crisis. We do have a map that shows the regions at the heart of the crisis. Could you please walk us through uh, what we're seeing here? Sure. Um, well, we have uh, in Gonasadage, which is near Oka, Quebec. You can see in the upper uh, left side of the map, that's where women began a peaceful protest. They had set up a fire in the pines when they, the community had uh, gone as far as they could in terms of trying to fight the community of Oka, trying to um, expand their golf course. And so the women of the community had decided, okay, we've had enough. We're going to set up a peaceful protest and a fire. And it was out of that as when um, the police, the Sûreté de Québec, were called in to remove the peaceful protesters that things began to escalate. And so we see out of that a 78-day standoff. It was um, the men of our communities uh, that came and supported the women. It was uh, men from other nations that came, Indigenous nations from across Canada, actually North America, that came and supported our women. 
And then also our community of Kahnawake blockaded the Mercier Bridge in support as well. So, and there was also protests across Canada and blocking of uh, railroads and things like that. Sarah, what do you remember thinking as you watched those events unfold 30 years ago? Well, it was really timely for me in my own education because I had just uh, gone to um, Lethbridge, Alberta. There was an innovative program there starting on uh, Aboriginal self-government, which was a promise of Section 35, was uh, self-government for Indigenous peoples. And to see this happening, and certainly um, uh, talking about the women, like Ellen Gabriel just blew my mind when I first seen her, when I first heard her talk. Heard her talk um, just and she was the leader, strength, right? Resilience. Yeah, she was a spokesperson, I believe, um, and, and she continues to be a, a really excellent spokesperson for various Indigenous causes today, and she, she also continues to educate on, on this situation and uh, why it's an important situation to resolve t uh, today, finally. Um, but just the, the act of self-determination by deciding enough is enough, mm -hmm. and um, what, what happened there was just so, I think News World was brand new at the time, so to see it 24-7, the conflict in real time, was just, I think, um, for me as a young Anishinaabe person, someone who, you know, wanted to be a lawyer, um, it was just, it, it definitely reinvigorated my, my resolve uh, to try to do, um, to try to lend my hand, but also that there's just something new here. No, you, you don't necessarily have to go to a government negotiation table um, because those didn't seem to be working. They were, in fact, languishing. And uh, there was, you know, there was new tools in the toolbox uh, with, uh, with the strong stand that uh, these people had taken and certainly supported by most Indigenous communities across Canada. And Gahande, what was it like for you 30 years ago seeing the events unfold? What do you remember? Well... Uh, well, at that time, I was 18. I had just finished uh, high school. Um, I think, you know, seeing my mother there and my sisters there and realizing that this was something really important in terms of my Mohawk identity at the time, which I don't use anymore. I use Gunyak Gahaga, as I mentioned. Um, but for me, I and I think a lot of other people, a lot of other young Indigenous people at that time, it was an awakening point. And to watch this unfolding invigorated a sense of pride in one's identity, but really, you know, it propelled me and others to go forward and, and examine, okay, what is that identity? What does it mean to be Mohawk? And so it, it really put me on a path towards learning, self-discovery, um, teaching, um, you know, really critically examining the issues and trying to communicate and teach those to students and others. We have one of um, the images that came out of the Oka crisis, uh, probably one of the most, one of the most uh, uh, famous pictures from there. When you see that picture, what does that image represent to both of you? Sarah, I'd like to start with you. I think it, it shows um, the strength and the resilience of the Mohawk people. And it, sh it also shows sort of the determined um, project of Canada to continue to colonize us. I think that's why the term decolonization is so much more meaningful to, mm -hmm. to Indigenous folks who are trying to, you know, transform our relationship in Canada with Canada and with Canadian society, um, decolonization. So this is, this is sort of the tipping point for me of uh, colonization. Gahande, when you see that image, what does it represent to you? That image, um, I've come to, when I first saw it, uh, to me it represented strength, it represented um, an aspiration, uh, it represented power and, and, and uh, you know, what, what, what I was witnessing my family and my community do. But then over time, uh, it's come to represent something very different. I had the opportunity to speak with Brad, the young man in the image, uh, the warrior in the image, more recently. And he explained to me when I asked him, you know, what does this image mean to you? He said, it's actually not an image about me. It's an image about colonization. It's about the imposition of an identity upon our people. And I thought about this some more, and I, I examined it within the context of my own culture, where 
we have a very different understanding about the role of our men and the responsibilities of our men. And we have a word that describes that, and it's called rodiskanragete, and it means to carry the burden of peace. And I think that, if I look back 30 years, is what the men were doing at that time, was upholding the peace, upholding a peaceful demonstration, upholding a peaceful movement to ensure that the land around the pines and in the pines and those pines themselves survived. So it's a very different understanding if we are to examine it further. Well, the, earlier this month, a convoy commemorated the 30 years that have passed since the Oka crisis erupted. You can see the Mohawk flag being flown proudly out of that first vehicle. Um, Gandhi, what do you want people to know about that Mohawk flag? Yes, well, in my master's degree, mm -hmm. my master's thesis actually was about that flag because I wanted to understand it further. I had been seeing it flown for the 10 years. I'd seen it flown at Oka. I'd seen it flown within the 10 years in different protest movements since that time. And so in the late 80s, I began to do the research for my work, my doctoral, my master's thesis. And I interviewed a number of people um, throughout Gothenwage, throughout Aguazasne, on what that flag meant and what it what its symbols mean. And also, I examined the work of a man, Louis Gardinier-Pedje Hall, who um, is the designer of that flag. And it comes out of his own artwork and understanding of our um, philosophical uh, underpinnings, which are rooted in the Guyana de Goa, which is the great law of peace. And so really, Guyana de Goa means a way of peace. So each one of those symbols in the flag is speaks to different elements, different parts of that philosoph philosophy. And um, so if, if we are to look at that flag in, the, in today, and if we were to understand the Guyana de Goa, we would see that it actually represents a peaceful way of life. It, it actually represents peace building and unity. And when, uh, during my research, it was very interesting, I went to a uh, burnt church, Eskinovic, among the Mi'kmaq, who had flown that flag in 96 uh, during the Lobster War. And I went to them and I said, this is who I am. This is where I come from. What does that flag mean to you? And so they would tell me the story of their community, the story of their their struggle. And then at the end of that, they would say, okay, now that I've... And, and they would describe the flag within that context and, and the impression that... 1990 had on them mm -hmm. to stand up and take a, you know, fight oppression. And then at the end of that, they would ask me, you know, wh what is this, where does this flag come from? And what was the most incredible point was the incredible thing that came out of those interviews and understandings was that, so this flag represents unity and resistance. And those people at Eskinovic had described it as a flag of unity and resistance without even knowing where it came from. It represented that. So this flag is really amazing because it has the ability to carry that message, which is the same message that we understand that our great law, our Guyana de Goa, is meant just to go out in all directions. So when you look at the flag and you see the yellow starburst pattern, that's actually the directions in the Guyana de Goa traveling out in all directions where people can um, follow its roots back and take shelter under the tree of the long leaves. And so that flag represents to me uh, through much thought and through much um, introspection, the Guyana de Goa as a living entity. Um, Sarah, just to go back to what you were saying before, uh, what uh, Gahande just said, it, is that, does that also speak to what you were saying about decolonizing, uh, changing the narrative, uh, and filling in the gaps where the context was missed the first time around? I, I think that that really is, uh, it resonates with me because I think that that's really um, back to original um, intent on on that nation to nation relationship was that we would learn how to do things better together. Mm -hmm. And um, all of these uh, resistance is about unilateralism really, and treating us all the same where we have 
different agreements, different arrangements, different relationships as Indigenous peoples with Canada. Um, I'm a Treaty 3 person. My relationship with Canada is quite different from uh, the Haudenosaunee people um, uh, because their orientation just to law itself is different from Anishinaabe orientation to law. So respecting that is really important. And so uh, decolonization is learning that we're quite um, an eclectic group of people as Indigenous people. But if we work together, some of our own ways of doing and our ways of thinking um, will be helpful to Canada. Our, our own rules, our own institutions, the way we do things. We've seen that in dispute resolution. We're seeing it a bit more in uh, human rights discourse, that Indigenous law really resonates just to, to people as human beings. And certainly the, the wonderful um, sharing of teachings uh, around the Haudenosaunee, um, it, it's just, it just, for me, it resonates as well because we're all human beings and that's really the project of nations is trying to live in peace. I have a few more pictures to show, and I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that they are a bit um, dis um, upsetting. The first picture we're seeing here is an effigy of a Mohawk warrior which was burned by area residents as they chanted uh, savage. Uh, the next picture we're going to look at is um, the rocks being hurled at a convoy of Mohawks. Um, and in, this car in the cars, children were in the cars and children ended up getting hurt. And I don't know if you can see, but you can see police. Um, and some people have said that the police didn't do anything to help. Um, Gahande, your mother and sisters were there. How did living through those events shape your family's life? Well, my, my mother and my sisters weren't in the rock throwing incident. Um, they were over in Gunasadage, uh, in the treatment center with, uh, the other people. Um, but our, our, Indigenous people are, we, we, we think a lot about and um, work towards enriching our community. We are a community of people first and foremost. And when I think about, uh, you know, the impact of those images, I see them now and it still hurts. It still, I can still sense out of it the danger that came, the, the trauma that has come, that came from our children experiencing those uh, events. Um, you know, there, that I think about the trauma that my, my sisters experienced and my mother and, you know, we've talked a lot over the years about the impact of 1990. Personal impact, familial impact, community impact, nation impact, and what we've come to understand as a family is that we need to move ahead. And so we worked really hard to build from those, that, that event, to build and learn from those experiences and say, okay, we're gonna make it different for our children and, and the coming faces, the seven generations to come. And so that has been our, our largest response in the last 30 years is we've gone on and you know established ourselves gotten an education we've had children i'm a grandmother now and i think about the impact of now as i revisit this with you i'm thinking about well what what is it that i can take away from this and teach my grandchild what is she going to learn because i think about this a lot as i teach in the classroom a lot of the students coming in now have no understanding they, they were not even born during 1990, but it is my responsibility as an educator to teach them and use it as a way to help them understand the history and relationship between Indigenous peoples and Canada. Um, I have a board here that I I wanted to read. Uh, earlier this month, Sean Carlton, an assistant professor in history and native studies at the University of Manitoba, wrote an op-ed for the Global Mail titled, Did Canada Learn Anything from the Oka Crisis? Here's some of what he had to say. 
He writes, in the 30 years since the Oka crisis, there have been many government apologies and promises to improve indigenous settler relations in Canada. These are important first steps, but they must be backed up by meaningful reconciliation, namely the return of land stolen during colonization. The future of indigenous settler relations depends on Canada's ability to resolve land struggles, such as the one in Ganasatage, which has been going on for 300 years too long. Sarah, what is your what are your thoughts on that take? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think that there has to be much more action rather than words. Uh, I, I think that you know, apologies have. Um, I, I think that they don't resonate as much anymore because of the lack of action afterwards. So we have many, many volumes of reports and studies about how uh, we can achieve uh, a truer reconciliation. But I think at this point in time, our youth and a lot of our scholars and advocates, they're just land back. There's a hashtag in social media, land back. I mean, that's just underlying everything. Um, if you're not willing to return the land, then... Um, Let's stop pretending that a reconciliation is in our future. And uh, let's let's talk about real and meaningful things and actions that will change the dynamics and relationships in a real way to allow First Nations to be self-sustainable because what, we're languishing. What would action look like for you? Um, I'm working on land claims now. And the, the, the imposition of unilateral principles and unilateral policies that restrict the return of land, the overemphasis on third party um, impacts and making sure that third parties are not impacted by land claims. It's just, I mean, that's not sensible. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to achieve a just settlement with those types of restrictions in place. And, and also, um, the Indian Act and the 19th century governance in Indian Act chief and councils. We need to restore the original jurisdiction that our governments once had and respect those governments. And, and that's really coming to play. Uh, and now you see more and more of, of those types of disputes going to court and courts are now recognizing the need to recognize uh, that these First Nations have governments that have true authority um, to be self-determining. And Gohande, what did you think of uh, those comments made by um, Sean Carlton? I think they outline a basis to the problem. I think that land back is only the foundation on which we can build. Our populations are one of the fastest growing populations. The majority of our populations are under the age of 25. And if we think about the size of our, our communities, the size of the reservations, the land granted to us, they won't hold us. They won't sustain us. And so we have, you know, we need to think about how can we, um, you know, what, what, what's, what does getting land back serve? It serves then as a basis for regeneration. It serves as a basis for building upon and increasing the capacity of our communities to look after ourselves. And I think Sarah has an important point where she talks about you know, the, the importance of recognizing our own traditional governance, our own governance systems that are still very much alive. They're still very much, but not they're not recognized by the Canadian state. And more and more, you know, we see that with, uh, you know, with Suetin, the, the conflict between the traditional system and the elected system in that dispute and the urgency and the, 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 the need for Canada and people of Canada to recognize that we have our own systems that speak to our, they, they look after community. They're based on a very different way of thinking. They're based on this, uh, you know, thinking about community, putting community needs first, putting relationships with the natural world first. We are the original, we, our original instructions tell us we are here to look after the earth. And so any kind of events that you see coming out since 1990 are all about that. They're about our enacting our original instructions, enacting our sovereignty to determine the future of our communities, to caretake our communities, to look after our children and the future generations. And I have to say, you know, this is not just about our own people. When we are caretaking the earth, we are thinking about your seven generations, 
the people, the children that are coming from you. And so this is not just about us. We are thinking about everybody because we are all in this together. And we have to start thinking about that and teaching and speaking with one another. Sarah, I wanted to jump off of what uh, Gahande was saying. How much of a role do divisions between traditional and elected leadership play in land disputes? Well, I, I think that um, the Indian Act governments generally are dealing with um, the relationship with Canada directly, um, the funding arrangements and the sort of the Indian Act powers. Um, for the First Nation government, for the most part, I think that's generally what's what happens um, with those communities that have fostered and revitalized traditional governance alongside of these. Um, they retain the, the authority over um, over the land and over the relationship uh, with other other um, nations, that diplomatic relationships, and of course, land governance and traditional territories. So, um, to to Canada needs to know more of this and have a more sophisticated understanding of what they've done historically with these First Nations, like the Haudenosaunee Confederacy um, uh, with Grand Council Treaty 3, they displaced this government that they made a treaty with in Treaty 3. So to understanding their own history is really important. Um, but some other communities too that I work with have merged these authorities into one. So the Chief and Council have Anishinaabe um, traditional governance as well. They're, they call their chief Ogama. Ogama Khan is the chief and council, so they take in uh, on both of those, both of those um, important uh, roles and authorities. Gahande and Sarah, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks. My pleasure. Nice to meet you, Sarah. All right. Take care. Nice to meet you. Bye. Bye. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Namki Wanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, Steve Pakin's blogs, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash daily.